Welcome. Welcome you to a public conversation that's convened by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, which is located at the University of Minnesota. It is the School of Public Affairs for the University of Minnesota. This is part of a series of events that we usually carry live. We've now moved them online. Um, this is part of uh, an ongoing series. Um, my name is Larry Jacobs. I'm a faculty at the University of Minnesota in the Humphrey School, and I'm speaking to you from St. Paul, Minnesota. We will be recording this and we will be making it available. We'll show you that information in a moment. First, I wanna just let you know that we wanna welcome your participation. You will see at the bottom of your screen, if you move your cursor down to the bottom, there's a button called Q&A. You got it. That's where you put in your questions and we're gonna to get to as many as we possibly uh, can get to. Uh, we're very excited uh, this Thursday, Senator Amy Klobuchar will be joining us to talk about her campaign, um, the work she's doing in Washington related to the coronavirus, the election coming up in the fall and how um, America is gonna process that and handle it. Uh, she'll also be talking about the um, really dire situation that had faced her husband uh, who had become ill with the coronavirus. Um, we're excited about that. That's noon on Thursday. We've got a series of events coming up in the coming weeks, and we'll be sharing that information with you. Today's event is uh, really quite significant, and we're glad you're joining us. Um, the topic is Ireland uh, in a time of, in which there's both Brexit moving forward, um, as well as the coronavirus that is swamping Europe and uh, many ways interfering with this very important debate. The overriding theme I, um, is, will the troubles that haunted Ireland for so many decades return? We're very fortunate to have a terrific set of, uh, a terrific presenter and, and guest, along with moderator. Desmond King is the Andrew uh, W. Mellon Professor of American Government at Field College at Oxford. He is a quite distinguished uh, uh, scholar. Um, he got his BA from uh, Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he got his doctorate uh, or dean letters uh, from Oxford University. He's a popular lecturer in um, Europe, in Asia, in the United States. And he's published many, many um, uh, articles, both in academic outlets and in popular outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and elsewhere. We're very fortunate to have Professor King. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be moderating this program, you and CARE, who is a correspondent at Minnesota Public Radio. And previously, um, Mr. CARE was the BBC uh, radio um, a reporter, Scotland. So it's BBC Scotland um, and knows quite a bit about uh, Irish and Scottish politics. So we're delighted to have um, both of these gentlemen with us. They will be taking over the program in a second. Um, but I want to just take a moment and thank you. Um, Professor King is joining us from Oxford, England. Um, it's a little later in the day for him than for some of us in the US, all of us in the US. And I want to thank uh, you and Kara. And we'll now turn the program over to them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Larry. And Desmond, it's, it's nice to meet you virtually, if, hopefully one day in person. But Indeed. I so, so I wanted to jump on to actually a piece of news. Uh, you'll forgive me as a, a news guy. This uh, immediately yep. caught my attention. Um, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in hospital. Uh, he's a week and a half after announcing that he had contracted the coronavirus. Uh, he still says that he's in charge. He's running the the British government, but um, I'm curious, I mean, what's your sense of the public reaction to this news? Um, well, I think it's very serious, the, the, uh, the event of going into hospital. Um, the, there's a lot of people going into hospital because of coronavirus and they tend to be ill, uh, seriously ill. So I hope he is not seriously ill, as seriously ill as that would suggest. Mm. Um, 
uh, I think he's clearly not, I just know the reports as you do, and he's not um, recovered in 10 days. The two classic, apparently the two classic symptoms of a cough and a fever have persisted and they've taken him in and they're doing tests and so forth. So he's had one night in hospital. He went in about this time yesterday and he's um, tweeted um, uh, an hour or two ago saying he's well and thanking the staff and so forth, so we'll see. Uh, I mean, it's a serious problem for the government because he says he's still in charge. He says he's still running it. Um, he's, he looked exhausted when he was seen on screen on Thursday, clapping the NHS staff with others. Um, so quite how he's able to run it is, is, is not clear to me. Um, the health secretary and the um, main, um, uh, his main colleague, Michael Gove, are, I think, running things mostly as best they can at the moment. But it's it's a very serious it's a very serious mood and issue. I think. And given I mean, this is a time of crisis, to lose any leader is mm. going to be a, a very serious issue. And uh, is the is it your sense that the the British government is set up in such a way that there can be an easy transition of leadership? Absolutely not. It's very it's it's extremely um, problematic because. Um, we don't have a deputy. We don't have a deputy prime minister in the way that there's a vice president of the United States who steps in, or if the vice president doesn't, then the speaker. So there's a very clear line in the U.S. Here it's collective responsibility, but under the prime minister, uh, he has designated the foreign secretary as the person who will uh, run things um, uh, in his absence. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure if something if he was to be out of action um, on a more serious basis. I don't quite know how, who would be in charge, but at the moment it's the Foreign Secretary who is, who is the person who would be. Um, I think that would be a very serious thing if it happened. I'd like to... There yeah. once when he was Prime Minister, was in hospital for a couple of hours, uh, or a couple of nights, I'm sorry. Um, and that was, I remember that as a period of crisis, but uh, uh, one of his deputies took over at the time. There's not much experience of this. No. I'd like to ask you just to take half a step forward, sorry, back. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you're there in Oxford, uh, which I have to admit is one of my favorite places ever to visit. It's such a wonderful place, a unique place. Um, but this is a time when the, the town is usually bustling, students looking forward to the end of term, the end yeah. of the year. What, what is life like? It's desolate, absolutely desolate. I, I walked around, this is Monday morning, and I walked around the, uh, I went in to do something at nine o'clock and there's just no, there's no life at all. There, there's nothing, it's extraordinary. You maybe pass three or four pedestrians in the course of you know, four or five kilometers, but that's it. The, there's one or two buses trundling along, they're empty. Um, there are no cars parked, there's nobody out. Um, there's nothing open except for supermarkets and um, chemists, that's it. So it's, it's an extraordinary, um, I mean, I think the, the lockdown is very successful. You, you'll have heard reports about London, people going out and so forth, mm -hmm. really hasn't been the case in, I, I think outside London to the same extent because um, people are lucky to have gardens and a bit more space. Uh, but um, the social distancing is certainly working in that sense. People are staying in their houses. I'm not doing anything and it's very devastating to see because everything it's it's terribly hard on people the the um all the cafes all the restaurants all the bars all the pubs are closed obviously and um uh no shops are open so i don't know if it's like this in minneapolis but it's but it's a complete shutdown um, you can get you can get to a supermarket that's it mm -hmm. we, we have a uh... A similar situation here. I mean, there are, there are, you do see a fair number of people out walking, exercising, things like that. But uh, there's also kind of a sense that there are hot spots. There are certain places that are severely affected and it is not hit elsewhere. And you, uh, you hear from those places, why, why are we doing this? Why do we have to suffer too? And I don't yeah. know if you've been hearing that from different communities. I actually was talking with my sister in Edinburgh yesterday. And she said, well, you know, there's nothing much happening here. Yeah, um, uh, Scotland is predictably more successful, I think, in, in, in dealing with uh, 
uh, they haven't had the same, quite the same level of, of uh, infections and deaths. Um, there are certainly hotspots. I mean, London is a hotspot. And beside is Birmingham uh, uh, is very much a hotspot. Um, I, 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 there is a little bit of a message not being clear because, because there aren't, um, it's not obvious that people are, are ill on the streets and so forth. You, you're not seeing that. Um, on the other hand, I certainly know people who are ill and I know one person who's died, sadly. And I know, I think most people now have some knowledge of somebody who's been unwell. Um, and I, so I, so I, there's, there's less of that, less of that concern. There is, there is real fear about the economy, as I'm sure there is in the States. There's just deep fear about how, how this catastrophe is ever going to be um, exited. We, we can talk about that. Yes. Well. So that's well, we, I think everybody feels. Mm -hmm. Well, we are of course here to talk about Ireland and the situation with Brexit and now under the coronavirus. And I just want to remind people who are uh, watching in that uh, we'd like you to join the conversation. You can click on the Q and A button on the toolbar of the webinar screen down there at the bottom. That will offer that will open a Q and A dialog box where you can type and submit your question, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So I, I wanted to start by, I mean, the, there are a lot of very romantic ideas in the United States about Ireland. And I thought we should maybe go through the realities <laughs> as it were. Um, can we start with the Republic? Can you give us kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of, of the, uh, that part of the Emerald Isle? Yes, yes. I, I mean, I know America. Well, I know there is a romantic perception, particularly um, in, in the 17th of uh, March on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it's a lot of it. And that's probably now very pretty remote from what Ireland is like at the moment, what the Republic of Ireland is like. It's, it's a very diverse country. Um, it has a, um, it, with Britain and Sweden, were the three countries which opened up to East European um, migrants in 2003. And there are um, many tens of thousands of uh, Lithuanians, Russians even, um, certainly um, um, Romanians, Bulgarians living in Ireland and Polish, sizable Polish community. There is remarkably um, uh, legislation um, legalizing same-sex marriage, which came recently, which is an extraordinary step for Ireland, certainly for the Ireland that I knew in the 60s and 70s, this was not something you would have predicted at all. And the Prime Minister, of course, the Taoiseach is, is himself gay and married. I'm not sure if he's married, but he has a, he has a partner. And um, he is of diverse background himself. His mother is an Irish nurse married to a doctor originally from India who met in England and then they settled, they were in our, lived in Ireland and he grew up there. He sounds just as Irish as anybody else. But to have a um, the son of, my, of a migrant who is gay as prime minister is not probably the image that a lot of people had of Ireland in the past. And it's a buzzling, booming um, society, very badly struck by the 2008 uh, crisis, extremely badly struck by that, uh, both because the banks have been excessively uh, borrowing and because property prices were out of control. So not dissimilar to the US, but just with a scale of effect, which is way, way higher proportionately. Um, until, this, uh, until this coronavirus struck, which has hit Ireland very hard, and in, they've been on a lockdown long, longer than the UK, um, they were doing quite well economically. Uh, unemployment rate was about 4%, which was extremely low historically. Um, economic growth was solid. The really huge crisis on the um, horizon was, was Brexit and what that would do to the Irish economy. So I think, I think, I think it's a pleasant place to visit still, and there's, um, it's, it's huge connections with America, and Americans are always extremely welcomed uh, in Ireland because a lot of Irish people have had uh, family members who've moved to America over the generations, so uh, there's a closeness there. But I think as a society, it's not quite as um, old-fashioned as it's been portrayed, or as it might be thought of still. We should uh, also talk about Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. um, pr probably has a much less romantic uh, reputation because yeah. of the troubles. Um, 
a very different place in many ways though i mean what's what's your your yeah it's extremely different that? it's very different um it's had uh, a remarkable um 21 years of um really peace uh, since 1998 um the preceding three decades three and a half thousand people were killed and since 1998 i think probably only about two have been uh, have died through because of uh, sectarian views it's um uh, it is a very divided society. Um, it's the population is now coming quite even between. Them. It's a country of 1.9 million, and about 48% are nationalist Catholic background, and about the other part, 52%, are um, uh, more are Protestants uh, with unionist leanings. Unionists wish see themselves as British, part of the United Kingdom. Nationalists, many of them, see themselves as Irish and have some notion that they might at some point be part of a, of a, of a republic across the whole country. I think the Brexit debate has been um, uh, damaging to the uh, sectarian lines in uh, Northern Ireland. The only party that supported Brexit was the uh, Democratic Unionist Party, DUP, which, which have been the largest party you know, uh, for the, on the Unionist side for the last two years. Uh, sorry, two decades. Um, the vote was something like 56, 57 percent to remain in Europe. But of that vote, the vast majority were nationalists with some, some unionists voting to remain, but most of them voting not to remain, despite what might have been the economic consequences. I think the debate was not very well informed at the time, and there was it was, it was, there was, there were various claims that the border would not be particularly affected by this. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland said that. It would not be checks on the border, but there was no basis for saying that because nobody knew what Brexit meant. Um, perhaps the, the, a statistic that's quite, it's quite uh, revealing is, is uh, education in, in um, elementary and high school levels, which is about 95% um, segregated. Uh, that is 95% of children under the age of 18 go to either a predominantly or overwhelmingly Catholic school or an overwhelmingly Protestant school. Only about 5% of the population of the children go to a school which is integrated. So for Americans thinking about the pre, pre 1970s uh, decades, we'll give you an idea of what, what that means. Mm -hmm. that, that actually is astonishing. That is an amazing number. And uh, I, I know that uh, a number of people here have been watching the television series, Dairy Girls, Oh yes, um, that's I great. Think, <laughs> yeah, which, um, it's very is, good. It is set a few uh, years ago. It's on Netflix, um, but it also kind of captures that yeah. certain sensibility. It, it's a very bittersweet uh, exactly. yeah. scenario. So yeah, no, it's an excellent series. I, I commend it to anyone. I think it's I think it's very accurate, and very very mm -hmm. informative, as well as being uh, extremely entertaining. Uh, yeah, I mean the division. The, the, sorry, uh, Ewan, but the division in, in Northern Ireland, is, it's, it's been expressed most recently in, in the, the, the approach to dealing with, this, um, with this, this killing virus. So the, the complex arrangement reached in Northern Ireland means that, that there is a, a, a first minister and a deputy first minister. And the deputy minister, the first minister comes from the unionist community, and it's Arlene Foster at the moment, and the deputy... Um, the First Minister comes from the nationalist community and it's Michelle O'Neill from Sinn Féin. So the two big parties are DUP and Sinn Féin. And these two are trying to work together. It's very hard because there's been a lot of antagonism for several years. But they've differed fundamentally on their approach to dealing with this virus, with coronavirus. Um, the Deputy First Minister O'Neill has wanted to follow some of the patterns in the Republic of Ireland. So the Republic of Ireland closed schools two weeks before the UK did uh, on the recommendation of the World Health Authority, whereas the First Minister said, we'll stick with UK rules and we won't close them earlier. Um, and they wanted to, they've disagreed on what, what sort of equipment is needed and so forth. And, and so even these things, there's a political agenda all the time and a, and a desire to, to go in different directions for unionists who, care about their British identity and being part of the UK, everything that can be done to tighten that integration is important for nationalists who may not necessarily want a united Ireland, but want to a 
align more closely with Ireland, then there is a tendency to take um, you know, different views. There's meant to be a discussion going on at the moment about the, the nuts and bolts of Brexit, including the very thorny issue of the border between the North and the mm -hmm. South. And uh, it seems that everything has gone into stasis on that. I mean, what, what, what is the situation with uh, the discussion now about actually getting the UK out and what is the impact on, on Ireland? Yeah, so I should say I'm a remainder, remainder, um, but um, I'll, so I'm sorry that the vote went the way it did. Nonetheless, where we are at the moment is that the Brexit has disappeared from the agenda. It's not being discussed at all in, in either the UK, uh, England, particularly, or in the Republic of Ireland or in Northern Ireland. The, everything is about coronavirus. This is overwhelmed. Um, slightly less so in Scotland. There's been some, some reference to it there as well, because the Scots, like Northern Irish, voted to remain uh, in, in the European Union. So two things, several things are, are important here. One is technically Britain has left the European Union um, and it will exit on the 31st of December this year, ideally with a treaty, with some sort of agreement, but without an agreement, it still leaves. Um, and that means on the 1st of January, 2021, there is uh, formal checks, passports, all the rest of it between Britain and uh, France or Belgium or the Netherlands, whichever country one person goes to, not Belgium, but the Netherlands or France, all the ferry lines. Um, the coronavirus, it seems to me, people, many people have said, won't this lead to a delay and, and so forth? Uh, why not? Because Britain has the option to request that the transition that we're now in be extended for another two or three years. Um, and the government has been adamant that they won't do that. And I think they, they, they were certainly very clear about that before this virus struck. And I don't think they're going to change on that front. Uh, ironically, the, the collapse in economic activity may be an advantage for them because one of the biggest concerns about an abrupt departure from Brexit would be a um, disruption of supply chains. But since there's really so little trade at the moment, the supply chains are actually very important to Britain because it imports so much stuff from Europe and it exports to there. And companies like the car companies are based here because they can export to Europe. But at the moment, because there's no economic activity, these are mute points. Um, in the South, in Re the Republic of Ireland, Brexit is a matter of enormous concern and um, for on, on several levels. One, on the economic level, Britain is its biggest trading partner. The UK is its biggest trading partner. And there's a great deal of cross-border trading between the Republic and the North. So there, there's a question about how to maintain that, particularly since there'll be different currencies uh, into the future. They are different currencies now, but the, the um, the pound had gone down so much that this was giving the um, uh, British um, exporters a competitive advantage. Secondly, there's managing the border with Northern Ireland. Uh, the Republic is going to be the, uh, in the European Union, it's going to be the final, uh, it, it constructs a border with the UK, which is between Ireland and the six counties. So if you think of Europe, the only other hard borders in Europe will be against Turkey, uh, or Ukraine, and then Ireland will be um, setting up the border with Northern Ireland. How that border is managed is, is hugely problematic. And the uh, Irish have said they don't want to put, the Republic of Ireland said they don't want to, to have border checks and border con uh, controls, but I think they will be required by the European Union. Um, the compromise to try and deal with that by Britain, sorry, this is rather going on too long, but. Briefly, uh, uh, Northern, Northern Ireland had a, um, uh, was designated to be part of the, the South for its uh, customs market and the single, uh, for the customs union and the single market with border checks between Northern Ireland and Britain, the mainland. Something extremely upsetting to unions. I remember crossing between the North and the South as a boy and seeing it as quite a strange thing because it was in it was kind of a, a border that wasn't 
except that it really was because there was <laughs> smuggling going on. Um, there were people who would, you know, nip across uh, to the other side, depending on, you know, the, the best prices for cigarettes and various yeah. kinds of booze and things like that. But, uh, but of course, there's also more, very more serious things, particularly during the Troubles, yeah. you know, crossing backwards and forwards. Uh, I mean, uh, does, does that history uh, impinge on this debate? Yeah, it certainly informs a lot of people who are having a concern about a border reappearing uh, will will point to those sorts of concerns. So there were there was a hard border between the North and the South for after 1923 when the when the Republic of Ireland was created. There was a hard border really on all the way up until the 90s, 1990s, and checking on customs items and then also on on, on smuggling, as you say, and so forth. But the border is whatever, um, 360 miles, very hard to, um, uh, to patrol. And so there's always been this kind of movement. I think the absence of a border, uh, so now you drive through and you, you, you might not notice quite as much as you did when you were doing it young, uh, when you were younger, um, uh, has, I think, helped in removing a lot of that uh, smuggling and customs um, circumvention and so forth. So the main danger, I think, is if, if a hard border reappears with, with checkpoints and, and so forth, this will be, um, this will alarm different communities in different ways. Mm. Has there so, been any thought about a wall, maybe? No, don't, don't answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe not a wall. Yeah. Uh, we, we've actually got a number of questions have come in already. And uh, Becca Wellner asks, how do socio-cultural differences between Ireland and the UK uh, for example, abortion impact the Brexit and the border. I mean, is there, you, you talked about the changes that have gone on in the Republic. Mm. Um, I mean, is, is it still really a separation between two very different cultures? Between the, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland? Yeah, and, but then I think now with Brexit, with the UK too. With the UK. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> Ireland has, again, a, <clears throat> it's a remarkable um, constitutional change on, on, um, 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 on abortion, which has become uh, possible in Ireland. And it's not possible in Northern Ireland at the moment. Abortions are uh, uh, illegal there, so they have a more restrictive law. I think, I think Ireland has become more liberal in a, in a British sense. Um, so... Britain has been more liberal on these on these uh, rules for quite a long time, so I think the cultural differences are um, ha were declining, and on and measures like the uh, like like same sex marriage or, or abortion laws, the Republic of Ireland is closer to Britain than Northern Ireland is close to Britain on, on that basis, and this is a concern for some members of Parliament. But Brexit has has. I'm afraid just um, uh, reified differences and strengthened differences um, because um, um, Ireland was Ireland and Britain joined the EU at the same time in 1973, together with Denmark. We're constantly told that the having this European forum was very helpful for um, British and Irish civil servants and politicians getting to know each other. And working because they have very similar, mostly quite similar ideologies. They're both sort of more lib they're both more liberal market economies than social democratic, like um, Nordic states, Scandinavia, and so forth, or Christian democratic, like Germany and um, uh, Austria. Um, and so that I think there's a there's going to be um, a tearing away from those differences, which is which is which have taken some time to build up. And that's going to be. It's going to be unfortunate in the long run. I don't know where it's going to lead to, but um, Ireland will will is very keen to be European and, 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 and likes being European and will continue to be. But um, its connections with, with with Britain, I think, will be declining quite quite significantly. The Good Friday Agreement, which we haven't talked about, the Belfast Agreement from 1998, is is part of international law and has one of the reasons why Brexit is so complicated for Northern Ireland is because it, it gives key um, responsibilities to the EU as part of this process. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, there you and go. The Euro yeah, and the European Court of Justice is, is, is something that's been quite significant 
in um, uh, reaching agreements. And there is another, um, you know, the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court on Human Rights, because both Britain and Ireland belong to these things, that, that has proved to be a forum that's been very important for resolving certain issues. Um, Britain certainly has talked about withdrawing from the European Court, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, which would have a lot of significant differences. So I hope that helps on the cultural differences. Um, um, I think the political differences are the, are the, the really important ones. Okay. No, I mean, just to touch on something you mentioned earlier uh, about the, the segregation of the schools in Northern Ireland. And uh, Catherine Guizen, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, wrote in and s talked about uh, the Dutch schools were very segregated uh, along class and religious lines within in the 1960s as various uh, there were various cultural changes. Now the, the schools are increasingly mixed racially and ethnically. I mean, it, are, do you see any evidence of a similar evolution happening in the schools in Northern Ireland? And are there groups no. working towards this? Yeah, there are groups working towards it. And, and I mean, one bright, one bright result in the last election, the election in December, the UK election, um, the Alliance Party did, did surprisingly well and uh, took an, uh, one, of the, one of the 18 seats that Northern Ireland has in Westminster. Um, and there's always been a kind of alliance and uh, effort. So the alliance is neither unionist nor nationalist and tries to build bridges across that. Um, there's always been important traditions in um, Northern Ireland trying to create integrated schools. Um, Quakers have been quite involved in this amongst other groups and there are many key uh, mem members of, of um, the religious, senior religious figures on both sides who have tried to work on this. Um, I, I don't see massive progress, I'm afraid. And there are um, uh, pretty regular periodic disputes around schools when there's efforts to make them more integrated. Um, I don't, I think there's, I think there are I think there are there are forces uh, very embedded who who wish to maintain the, the current position, and I would say you know including the senior hierarchy in the in the, um, the various religious uh, organisations. Um, it's a problem from me, me just looking at it. I mean, I have no particular knowledge and there's no particular expertise, but I thought it was always a problem that having reached this. Um, useful agreement in 1998 that created the basis for the uh, restoration of government in Northern Ireland with the executive that's now in place. But the issue of cultural change and social change was, was um, not really thought about and much harder to, to do on that basis. And of course, you know, the vote, people forget, but in 1998, the, the agreement that that's called either the Belfast Agreement or the Good Friday Agreement was was um, was reached between the moderate the moderate parties the so-called moderate parties of the unionist side and the nationalist side, but the result politically and electorally was a huge success for the two um, uh, more so-called extreme parties, the Democratic Unionist Party and the and Sinn Fein on the nationalist side. They are now the two dominant parties, which was not the expectation or intention. Of the um, of the agreement has proved a workable basis for progress. Um, people may not remember the names, but there was a remarkable moment when Ian Paisley, the Reverend Ian Paisley, and Martin McGuinness, so Ian Paisley, the founder of the Democratic Unionist Party and an extremely staunch unionist, and Martin McGuinness, who was a Sinn Fein elected um, uh, member of Parliament and had also been a um, uh, very involved in the in the Republican movement in the IRA, that these two figures should work together in government, and they did. But this, but the subsequent political leaders have, I think, worked less successfully well together. Is it not true that uh, McGuinness and Paisley became known as the Chuckle Brothers because they were <laughs> they were yeah. working together so well? Yeah. Yes, yeah. they did. They did. It was a remarkable transformation. Um, or uh, particularly, I think for Paisley, who had been not 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 so not you know had been very hostile to any kind of communication between them, but they were both they proved to be, I suppose, statesmen in the sense they were able to say, okay, you know, we've reached this agreement. We're going to trust 
that the other side is saying is going to do what they're saying they're going to do and, and, and move on from there. We should, we should talk about the economy a little. We, you mentioned it briefly. I mean, the, um, the, the early 2000s were very hard on Ireland yeah. uh, with, with the economic crash and things were building back up. And um, I'm now seeing predictions of uh, a recession, if not uh, worse, um, if, uh, as a result of the coronavirus. Um, what, what's your understanding of um, what that will happen, that, what, what that will do allied with what potentially might happen with Brexit? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, yeah, disaster, I think. So, so Ireland was extremely hard hit by 2008. Um, it was really as hard hit as, as Italy and Spain and Greece um, in terms of the... Um, the, the, the hit to the economy, the level of borrowing from um, international organizations, including the IMF and the um, European Union. Um, and unemployment went up dramatically to about 18%. The, um, it took a few years, but austerity was implemented, very tough austerity. Salaries of all public sector workers were reduced by 15%. Pension contributions were reduced and so forth. Um, lots of people leaving migrants from that period, but it had it 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 it's done remarkably well. And by the last two years, it's been not only having high growth rates, but also having uh, low unemployment. It's um, dependent on certain markets that exports a lot to the United States. About thirty five percent of its exports go to America, so demand in America has now collapsed. And also it's part of the EU and some of its goods have been subject to um, the Trump tariffs, um, as have French products and Italian products and Scottish and Scottish products too. Um, so that, that's been damaging and, and, and slowing things down. The, uh, um, the collapse of the pound after Brexit, not the collapse, but the, but the significant devaluation of about 15 to 20% meant that um, competing with British uh, goods was extremely difficult. So all this was looming and Brexit was, lo was looming and the question of what sort of agreement would be reached in terms of the uh, customs union and the single market. Um, and then this is hit. And I, I mean, it's rather like the, proportionately, it's very similar to what happened in America with 3.3 million people one week and then the 6.6 .6 million the next week signing on for unemployment. In Ireland, something like 120,000 people turned up on a Friday. Um, and then the following week, I think another 180,000. Um, it's, it's very dependent on the tourist sector. It's very dependent on the um, um, uh, entertainment uh, industry, hotels, restaurants, bars, um, concerts, so forth. Um, and these, these have just stopped, um, just ceased completely. Mm. The, there, I mean, there are no tourists and so forth. So, and unemployment has now reached, it's projected to reach about 18% pretty rapidly. Um, and it seems to me, you and it's, we, we don't know where we are with this in, in, in most countries. If this lockdown persists for beyond three months, then it seems to me the recovery is just going to be really difficult to imagine and the length of time it's going to take. And I'm sure, I'm sure some governments are trying to work this out. Um, we uh, hope they are. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope so. yeah, yeah. Um, so, th if there's some sort of phase return from that, then that might be might be quite quite useful. I mean, I I do think Brexit has been pushed away, and I don't know whether whether um, whether um, the lack of economic activity will mean Brexit just takes on a different different sort of significance because there'll be such a ground zero for so many places. Um, but, I mean, it's it's tempting to be skeptical because with Brexit itself, there was so many kind of decisions made on debt, or there have been so many decisions made at the very last minute all the way down. And it looks like this is being potentially pushed into yet another very last minute, not very well negotiated discussion. I think that's quite likely. Yes, I think it's quite likely that they'll, I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard anything contrary from the British government, but they were adamant until six weeks ago that Britain would be leaving. They would, they would not ask for an extension this June or July, and that they would leave on the 31st of December with or without a treaty. Um, and but of the, course, it's been a, a heck of a six weeks. It has <laughs> been, it has been, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but but the cabinet that that Boris Johnson runs is is entirely Brexit based. All the members of the, of the cabinet are pro Brexit. Uh, he transformed it so he's because he took took him, he took it as a mandate from the election uh, to uh, to have such a membership. So people who 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 had not really been thought of as having political prospects before are, are members of the government uh, for that reason. Um, and of course, Ireland is you know had an election. There's no government in Ireland technically at the moment. They're trying to negotiate, and there was this dramatic uh, vote for Sinn Fein, who got 28, um, sorry, 25 percent of the vote, and has has left have left um, the political system sort of um, uh, very unstable and very fragile. And the the current Taoiseach Leo Varadkar is is carrying on in the position. Uh, in the position, but but it's not not actually a formed government. So it's a bit like Belgium. I mean, Belgium tends to go for eighteen months without governments, and that's what it's like at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I I think the um, yeah. So there's two I things. Also, I, yeah, I also see there's the also the U.S. Has, sorry, go on. I, I also see that the the Taoiseach has now uh, reactivated his medical license and is going to be actually working in a hospital yeah. at least one shift a week, which. I, <laughs> <laughs> Probably will not help in terms of negotiation. No, 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 no. I mean, I hope he doesn't catch the virus. Um, and the other, the other aspect of the economy in Ireland is 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 its huge dependence on um, U.S. multinationals who are based there, both based there to use it as a as a as a springboard into Europe um, and to use it as a place to outsource from the U.S. That sort of activity is 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 obviously going to be disappearing for a lot of companies um, after this crisis because of the incentive structure in the US to bring them back to the, to the US and, and um, the tax act passed at the end of 2017 was very, um, uh, very significant for changing the incentive structures for a lot of multinational corporations. So things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, likewise, we have a, a question here from uh, one of the, the viewers saying that uh, I heard that many large corporations were moving from Northern Ireland to Dublin, uh, probably as a result of uh, Brexit. Is this true? If so, what might be the economic impact of that? Yeah. So um, we, we, there have certainly been some significant movements of uh, banks to Dublin from uh, banks and insurance companies from London. Um, the banks have had to... Do, the, f the whole financial sector in England, which is a huge part of the economy, it's about 16% of the of, uh, GDP services, um, and they do a lot of their trading across the single um, market and the customs union, and they have been setting up branches either in Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam to a less extent, and Dublin. And Dublin has the advantage of the time, same time zone as the UK, it's English language, the legal tradition is the same as uh, England, they both use common law, and it's possible for uh, English trained lawyers, probably, and Scottish lawyers, Scottish law is, as you know, completely different, it's, it's own legal traditions, but it's possible for English lawyers to uh, enroll, to, to pass what in effect is the, the bar in Ireland um, uh, fairly quickly and to be accredited there. And there's been a lot of that. That has been quite modest in the sense that a lot of firms have just set up um, shop with two or three people in it um, because they don't want to move the whole the whole um, the whole sector. Uh, a f there are a few exceptions. One or two banks have have decided to make it a, a very big centre. There aren't so many leaving from Northern Ireland to the south, but there are definitely quite a few leaving from from England. But again, this is all pre this crisis, and I don't know how it's going to going to look afterwards. Certainly. When Britain leaves the EU, and if there's any sort of normal level of ac economic activity, then a lot of UK-based firms have got a challenge about how they continue to trade in your financial sector firms, and it's a very important industry. They will lose um, uh, what's called the uh, passport rights, which is um, an agreement whereby uh, a product that's approved in any one of the 28, let's say an insurance product, or a, um, or a bond that's approved in any of the 20, uh, one of the 28 European Union member states is equivalently accepted in all the others. That's, that's quite a loss that they're going to, to lose. So it's an incentive for having a basis in Ireland. The Central Bank of Ireland has been pretty tough about this, however, and 
which is the regulatory authority, and say that you know they're, they're getting a lot of applications from firms to set up there, but they're but they're setting up fairly um, demanding standards. They don't want just somebody to have a phone line that's there. We have the the T word in the title for this uh, discussion. Uh um, and we've actually had a number of questions about that, uh, including this one from Christine Preston. Uh, do you see the potential for a return to violence if uh, the Northern Ireland economy suffers and the country grows increasingly impatient with the UK's Brexit strategy? And I suppose now with uh, the coronavirus piled on top of that? Um, I certainly did before the coronavirus hit. Um, I, I, I think we we know that both communities in Northern Ireland feel extremely um, strongly about the and they um, the unionist community at the moment is uh, extremely agitated about the proposal to have a border check between goods going from Northern Ireland. To and coming from the British mainland to Northern Ireland. Well, actually, they won't be checked so much going there, but the other way. Um, they are um, agitated and see this as a, a means of uh, reducing their level of integration into the United Kingdom. And that's what they care about. Uh, historically, this kind of um, agitation has certainly had uh, violent expressions. Uh, on the other side, the, the, the nationalist community is extremely concerned about the prospect of a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And um, there's certainly a, a tradition of um, Republican activism that would take a, take a, um, a collective response to that, which would be um, uh, not peaceful. And we, there are groups, um, not, not Sinn Féin, but other groups that broke away uh, uh, after the peace agreement in 98, who have stated that they will not put up with borders and, and are indeed in some ways are still continuing a, a very a minor campaign uh, of dissidents, as it's called, dissident IRA. So I think on both sides, this is a very serious prospect. Now, I know some people feel that talking about it makes it makes is worse and one shouldn't talk about this and there's absolutely no reason for uh, violent responses and I entirely agree with that but I think the what we know historically is that the level of um, of dislike of the two communities and the level of concern about defending each other's turfs is uh, extremely high so I certainly wasn't um, I was very I've been very anxious about it um, about the return of, of um, uh, of um, discontent. The level uh, Northern Ireland has not done as well economically as certainly as the Republic and certainly not as parts of England. Um, it, this, this coronavirus will have to be another blow to the economy. Um, the, there's always a new generation of young, um, uh, young people who, who um, are willing to take certain stances on this view. Mm -hmm. Um, it's clear that the mainstream parties are not going to be involved in Sinn Féin or DUP or any of these parties are not going to be involved in any kind of um, uh, violent activities and, and are doing their best to prevent them. But there are, there are potential uh, flashpoints, uh, whether these can be maintained or not, we'll see. I noticed the parade for the 12th of July has been cancelled, um, all the parades around the country, and that's probably a good sign because that's quite often a, a difficult day. Yeah, I, I know that uh, there's been a, a certain rise, particularly in Scotland, of the of nationalism, and you know the the United Kingdom has always been this balancing act, uh, kind of the tensions between the the various countries involved, and it seems likely that there's going to be a very concerted effort for independence, an independence campaign in Scotland, perhaps to a lesser extent with Wales. Um, and I mean, how much of an influence would that have on the situation in Ireland? We've actually had several questions. Um, mm -hmm. And then even someone saying, how much is the Scottish involvement in Ireland? <laughs> how much of a, uh, an influence will that have? Yeah, so great questions. Um, I mean, um, 
Scotland and the Republic of Ireland don't have that much natural affinity. I mean, Scotland is, a, as you know, is a much more Protestant society um, and a unionist society than, than Ireland uh, is now or has been. Um, and, and of course, many people in Northern Ireland are descendants from Scots who were yeah. brought over by Cromwell. So they've That's been right. there for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the term Scots Irish is is an Ulster Irish and so uh, Ulster Scots and so forth is a particular has a particular meaning and and um, and there's a language there are languages connections around it. Um, Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic are, are similar but not 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 that um, not that identical. But they're both sort of thriving languages in their own ways um, at the moment. So I I. I, I I think the mood for for independence in Scotland is is very strong, um, and but whether it'll get over the threshold for a referendum is not clear, and it's 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 murky at the moment um, for boring reasons of domestic politics in Scotland. But I but I think it's 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 a very strong and vital case, and uh, stopping it will will require um, efforts by the Labour Party to re-establish itself there. And you may know they just elected a new leader on. Friday, Chris Dahmer, who I, or Saturday, who I think will be um, significant in that, may, may have an appeal in Scotland. Um, the, so, so I think the English have lost interest in, they certainly don't care about, about Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, and, and this, this particular government doesn't care about them. And I, I think they're pretty indifferent about Scotland too. It's, there aren't really any conservative MPs. Um, it's not part of the cake. It, it's, so if the Scots vote for independence, I think they, they prefer if they didn't, but I think it's now something that if it happens, it happens. And it, it may turn out to be a case. I, I don't see it happening in the next five to 10 years, despite the strength of Scottish nationalism there. I think the connections between Scot Scotland and Ireland may increase um, after, I mean, there is normally supposed to be a, a, a British Isle, um, a British Council made up of, British Isles Council, which has representatives from the five nations, um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, um, at ministerial level, it hasn't, which was created by the 98 Act again, the, the peace agreement. It hasn't been as busy as it might have been, but I think with Brexit, it, could be, it, it would be very helpful if it were to meet regularly and to take an agenda. And several people have suggested that might happen, but we'll mm -hmm. see. Um, it's, it's, it's very complicated. We've been talking about um, some pretty gloomy uh, prospects. Um, <laughs> there are, of course, many people who, well, not many, there are, the, the great thing about the Irish is their creativity. I mean, is there mm. potentially opportunity in this mess for Ireland? Uh, yes. I mean, it's a very educated um population um actually like scotland more so than england so um the percentage of children who who complete education to the age of 18 and and uh leave high school with respectable grades it's very similar in um in ireland where they do the leaving certificate in scotland where they do the hires whereas in england you still have a good 30 percent of children leaving school um uh, a couple of years earlier so that's that's a strong basis the um I mean, I, I do think creative. I do think the creative arts are going to be very important after we get through this this misery. I think I, I'm I'm saying to anybody I know if you you know if you've got a turn for comedy, I think there's going to be a huge demand for for entertainment afterwards. And so um, on that basis, in a loose sense, I mean, there is an infrastructure in Ireland already for the creative arts. Um, anybody who's an artist can live there without paying uh, income tax up to a, a reasonable salary for that. I think it's about $40,000. Um, that was something created in the 1970s. Um, so writers, artists, uh, architects, painters, sculptors, and so forth um, all in, enjoy this. Uh, there's a very successful arts institution called Aestona, which recognizes the talent of, um, of uh, scholars there who are working in, this, in these fields. But in that sense, that's not going to be everybody, I understand, but I think there is there um, there is a creative base in the in the um, major cities, which are quite important. Places like Galway are very 
very lively, have been very culturally um, uh, rich in the last few years. Um, so yeah, I would be mildly optimistic about that. I mean, rather like Scotland had its flourishing in the uh, 70s and 80s with fantastic arts and um, uh, movie making and so forth. So I think these things do happen. I have a whole lot of questions here and I'm wondering if we can do a, a kind of lightning round and yeah. run, <laughs> run through a bunch of them, kind of uh, almost yes or no uh, yes. answers. So uh, from one person, how do the younger citizens of the Republic, say under 35 or 40, feel about a closer relationship with Northern Ireland, perhaps even a true Irish Republic? Um, it seemed for a while that might be a possibility, but what, what do you think now? Well, masses of them just voted for Sinn Féin in the Irish election. And Sinn Féin's primary ambition is to create a united Ireland. The opinion polls suggest they voted for it because they're very unhappy about um, uh, the cost of housing and health care. Uh, but I think that they're, they're, not in, they're, they're probably more indifferent than, than advocates of that sort of arrangement, but it might well end up that they become supportive of it. Uh, let's see. There's so many questions here. The, um, do you know, we, we, we covered a lot of these too. Uh, okay. I mean, I'll just say on the, on the unification issue that, uh, that for people under, under 35, certainly around the, their, their knowledge of the, uh, troubles is, is something that is not direct. And so this is in the past. So the basis for forging longer term uh, relationships would be quite important. On the other hand, there aren't really that many, there aren't that many direct links between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic. Most people don't really have uh, uh, contacts across the two. We got a question from Harrison Deckard saying the US is accepting supplies from China and Russia to fight the virus outbreak. Uh, the largest in the world. Is this potentially a new front or opportunity for positive foreign relations? I assume he means between uh, Ireland and the UK, are the Republic and the North. And the North. Uh, yes, I think so. Well, I mean, the Irish government um, commissioned a um, jumbo sized plane load of uh, supplies, masks from China. And they did, they did that jointly with Northern Ireland. Uh, with the finance minister, and that was quite that was a very unusual step, but, they, but that and that was done last week. So I think that was that was a level of communication that was one wouldn't have expected. On the other hand, the finance minister responsible for it in Northern Ireland is a member of Sinn Fein, not of the um, EUP. So I'm not sure it would have happened the other way around. So we're we're actually just about out of time. Um, I'm just curious uh, as we wrap up as we talk with you sitting there uh, in your office, are, are you, do you find, I mean, what is your, your mood? Are you uh, pragmatic? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Where, where do we go from here, do you think? About, about everything or? Well, specifically about Ireland. And, about Ireland. and I suppose it's because we're now in this global thing, it's about everybody, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I'm not desperately optimistic. I mean, I think they've got, they've, there's going to be, a, I have a lot of friends in, in, in the Republic and in Northern Ireland who I, I'm in touch with uh, all the time. And um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of battering down the hatches and, and mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Um, the, my friends in business are in difficulty because business activity has stopped. Um, and my friends in the, who are working in the public sector are um, anticipating some sorts of cuts coming. So um, I don't think there's particular reasons to be, to be too sanguine at the moment. Um, um, but I think that's true of, of the UK and probably is certainly true of say Italy at the moment or Spain. So I, so I think it's really, that's part of a pattern how things are going to develop. I think there's a bit of, there's a, there's a, slightly greater alarm in the Republic because they have recovered from these savage debts um, accumulated in 2008. And to have that suddenly seems uh, uh, something that's just evaporated. Um, 
Desmond King, I think we should probably wrap up there. At this okay, point, thank you very much. The, there should be thunderous applause because that is <laughs> traditionally how these things end. But thank you very much for sharing your time, sharing your thoughts, sharing your expertise. And uh, thanks too to all the people who uh, were uh, following along online. And thank you to the many people who submitted questions. So um, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.